I guess I'm better late than never today. Having had a few computer glitches here, I am finally with you. And I'm sorry if you tuned in on time and I wasn't able to be there. But here I am, and if you're with me, um, please check in on the comments and let me know that you're here with me. It would be wonderful to know that I'm not talking to myself. Um, other than that, though, I will just kind of launch, and I'd like to talk today about um, a case of the Friday blues, um, not having anything to do with my computer problems. Just, I want to talk about blue as a color, and maybe explore some of the different blues that are on my palette, and ones that I've been considering trading out and just kind of talking to you about the various colors of blue that are on my palette, talking about their various qualities, what I find as their strengths, what I find as their weaknesses, and um, I will just kind of walk you through um, how I test colors and how I kind of keep track of things a little bit with charts, and hopefully it'll be a fun little thing for you to um, to do along with me, perhaps, or to just watch and listen uh, um, to my opinion on a few of these colors. Hello, Cheryl, and hello, Marilyn. Thanks for checking in and letting me know that you're here with me. Um, and I apologize again for being late, but it is what it is. Some days things work out and some, some days things don't, especially when we're trying to do things live. I'm going to take you to my tabletop, though, and I'm going to show you what I have prepared. Those of you who have studied with me have probably seen this palette of colors chart and um, it's one that I enjoy having around and have talked about how to make in a previous video and so if you missed that and um, would be interested in how I set about making this, um, check out some of the other videos on my um, on, on this watercolor fun and free page or um, maybe on my YouTube channel too. Sometimes um, my YouTube channel is a good place to kind of look for things that um, might be resources for you. Um, anyway, I'm going to put my little face down here in the corner so I'm not just an anonymous talking head. Hello, Carolyn. Um, I am persevering and I am happy to be here with you. It's always my goal to be timely and dependable. It's just that, try as I might, sometimes things just don't work out as I had hoped. But that's part of art, right? Is just persevering in the face of obstacles sometimes. I'm going to play with, um, with my blues, like I mentioned, and I'm going to sort of turn my palette around in a way that I don't normally have it oriented, just so that you can see the blue side of my palette. I'm going to start out with a color that is probably familiar to you. It's a phthalo blue color. Now, what you might not know about phthalo is that it comes in a couple different shades. This happens to be a phthalo blue red shade. So what does that mean? It means that it is um, leaning toward red on the spectrum, and it also means that in mixes um, with yellow, that it might make a little bit duller green uh, because of the red undertone to the color. Um, also, it would mean that it would make a more brilliant violet. Um, because of the red undertone in the color. So it's just something to keep in mind when you um, see that the fact that a color leans to the red or leans to the yellow, um, it pretty much is telling you how it's going to mix as a secondary color into either a violet or a green. If it leans toward the yellow, then it'll be more, um, or, or leans to the green, it'll it'll be better in a green shade or more vibrant. If it leans to the red, it will be better in a more violet shade, more vibrant. 
So let's check, let's check this um, phthalo blue red shade. It is a very transparent color. And how do I know this? When I go over this swatch of black, it disappears. It absolutely disappears. You cannot even tell that I have painted over this. And this is a really good, this is a really good attribute to know about in a color. Um, whether or not it is transparent is so important. And sometimes we don't know the attributes of our colors. And so what I'm going to test here today by having this black line across the paper is the transparency. And then I'm going to also create a lifted line as a secondary test. Um, to, and what I'll be testing there is the liftability of the color. So we'll be testing a couple of things in this chart. And how I set this up was I took some um, washi tape, just some cheap washi tape that I got at the dollar store, and I, I put it down in vertical columns, and then I went across with a Sharpie marker in black. And so it's going to hopefully give me kind of a neat looking um, chart to end up with. And you'll see with, along with me whether or not that actually turns out to be the case. The next column I thought I would try is perhaps not a pure blue, but I wanted to, um, to bring it up because I let my phthalo green and my phthalo blue share this well over here in the corner. It's a large well on my Quiller palette. And the reason I let them do that is that there is a convenience color out there called phthalo turquoise, but I don't necessarily want to have yet another color on my palette. So I let these two share the well, and I'm going to pull a little bit of the phthalo blue and a little bit of this phthalo green, which is a blue shade, so it will hopefully go well with this blue and I'm going to come up with a phthalo turquoise as a result of that mixture. And so maybe I'll just lean it just a little bit more to the blue there, and I've got a very beautiful phthalo turquoise, and I'll bring it over here to this column. And it is a beautiful turquoise color, teal and very transparent, because both of these pigments are thalo and anything that is labeled thalo, you can count on it being two things, well, three things. You can count on the fact that it is very strong. You can count on the fact that it is very transparent. You can also count on the fact that it is um, very, uh, very light fast, permanent is another word for that, but light fast is, um, is a, a characteristic of the phthalo colors. Light fastness is important um, because it means that that color is going to last even when exposed to light. Um, another thing that you'll be able to assume about any color called a phthalo color is that it's going to um, likely be a staining color and a non-granulating color. So you're not going to get those little itty bitty um, bits in, in washes that sometimes you'll get from other colors, especially like ultramarine or cobalt. Those colors tend to granulate when they're very wetly applied. But never will you have that um, happen with a phthalo color. So there's a lot of wonderful attributes to these phthalo colors. Chroma-wise, they're very brilliant. They're not dull colors there at all. And so sometimes they will read slightly artificial. Um, and you know, you just kind of have to gauge whether or not um, the, the color that you want is, is going to um, lend itself to having a, a phthalo color as 
in the mixture. But anyway, that is um, a real kind of a summation of the phthalo colors. Now this next color is also a turquoise color. And you'll see on my palette that it's not all that dissimilar from the phthalo, um, the phthalo version of the turquoise. So I'm going to bring it over here and I'm going to show you though how different it is when we go over this black line. Check it out. It is much more opaque. It stands out on top of that black line. And you can see it very evidently. Um, I'll bring it up a little closer. Can you see how it really shows up on top of that black line? And that tells you that it is semi-opaque. Um, that's an issue. It can mean that it's not going to play well in mixtures, that it's going to tend to muddy up a mixture of color. Um, that's one reason that I have both of these colors on my palette. Cobalt teal is a good sort of dessert color to put in at the end of a painting because of its opacity. It will be able to cover things and it will be able to put a little punch in on top of a passage that might not be possible if I'm trying to achieve the same thing with transparent phthalo turquoise. So if I want to set up a little color on top, I'll reach for my cobalt teal because of its opacity. So you just kind of have to know these attributes of, about your colors. And if you don't know them, I really encourage you to maybe take a moment and make a chart like this of all your blues. So you kind of get a clue of when and where um, or how a color is going to perform. So this cobalt teal is a beautiful color and not altogether different from this um, mixture of phthalo blue and phthalo green, but it has a different quality in its opacity. It's also going to, um, it's also going to demonstrate some other differences when we set about trying to lift the color, but I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to tell you everything right now. Antwerp Blue is this next color on my palette. And it is, um, it is more, it is more similar in color to um, the Thalo. And yet when it is applied thickly, and it can get very dark, but when it's applied thickly, it can become in my experience, a little opaque, and I'm going to try to demonstrate that here. And it it's it's trans it's sort of it's sort of semi-transparent. Let's put it that way. It it just gets um, it has the capacity to really read darkly, and on top of this black, it's kind of hard to see. But it does sort of set up. Um, it has a little bit more sedimentary quality to it than the, um, the phthalo color does. And um, in mixes, I have found that it really can create, if I want it to be a dark green, if I add a lot of Antwerp, sometimes I feel like it's, it gets a little too opaque. But Antwerp does like to mix into greens. And so it is, um, it is a nice blue. Sometimes I tease that I feel like it has a color identity issue. Um, so something to, um, to keep in mind is that it has a little more opacity. Um, it can get quite dark. It does like to go to green. Um, and, and yet it is sort of a middle of the road enough blue that it can turn into a violet as well. So it's, it's a nice versatile blue and it really does have um, lovely color. Um, this, is a, this is a favorite of a lot of people. Cerulean blue is the next color on my palette. And this one is one of my favorites for skies. Um, it has a kind of a, a gray quality to it, um, a little bit of 
granulation to it and it's also as I don't know if you can see it in the camera but I'll hold it up here it's also got slight opacity to it now this brand is M Graham and for me that's an important distinction because I have found that this color likes to dry up in the palette and since I tend to like a moist palette um, this matters to me so I buy the M Graham and you can see that it is setting up with a little bit of opacity as is the Antwerp I I can see it just well I, I think I'm being a little bit picky but the cerulean is definitely got some opacity to it it's definitely lightening up that black and so um, just know this about cerulean that it does have a little bit of opacity to it it does have a little bit of granulation to it you can see that granulation occurring here in this mix um, at least in person I don't know I think it's showing up a little bit on the camera um, it uh, it likes to dry up in the well and so if you like this color I might suggest that you think about um, ordering the M Graham version which tends to stay moister in the palette. Um, M. Graham is generally moister in the palette. They use honey as a mixing agent or a humectant, which is just a fancy term for a moisture holder in, in the mixture. Um, and so I find it's wonderful as a studio paint I don't like to use M. Graham in my travel palettes because I have found because those paints stay so moist, sometimes they run. And um, there's, you know, that is not, to, not necessarily a great attribute in a travel palette that might get tilted in your suitcase or in your travel bag. So um, M. Graham is great for the studio. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's a beautiful line of paints. But maybe think about um, trading it out for something else if you're, if you're going on the road with it. Um, manganese blue is a very similar color. Um, and sometimes I wonder if I need both of them on my palette. But it's a very transparent, beautiful blue. A little more brilliant than the cerulean. It's just got... Um, a little more brightness to it. Now one thing to remember is that uh, these colors, their brands matter. Um, I'm giving you my brands here. This is a Winsor Newton manganese blue. And the reason I'm giving you the brands is that it does matter. There is no uniformity um, to the color composition or the nature of a color um, in the in the paint industry um, it is it's a sad but true fact that it's kind of a buyer beware situation and um, so this one is a manganese blue by Winsor Newton I like it a lot and um, you can see that it's pretty similar in color with the cerulean but it's not as opaque it's it's more transparent so if I need to um, I need a color of this sort and I want to use it in a mix I'm gonna probably grab my manganese blue rather than my cerulean um, it just depends but cerulean would be more of a of a dessert color or um, or a more grayed blue, a nice sky blue. Um, manganese is, is great for light greens and um, light, you know, sort of pretty violet colors. I think both of them um, do well with this manganese. Sky blue is another color that I got introduced to by Janet Rogers. And the composition of sky blue is phthalo and white. Okay, and um, sky blue is an American journey color, which Cheap Joe's manufactures. And um, 
the sky blue, when the minute you see that a color has white in it, you can make one presumption, and that is that it's going to be opaque. And sky blue is opaque. It's, um, it's a beautiful color, though, and um, it does have that um, very pretty sort of sky blue flavor to it. Honestly, I'm considering taking sky blue off of my palette because I feel that it is so similar to the cerulean and the manganese that I use. And so I'm, I'm, I haven't been refilling this well, and it may very well be that, um, that this color will be replaced. But it, it is pretty, and I do find reason to use it. Um, you can see that beautiful... Um, I just think it, it, it's, it's really a beautiful color. So um, if you have it, um, just know that it's going to be somewhat opaque and that the constituent colors are actually phthalo and white. So if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to eliminate it from your palette and you had a little white around, you could just mix it with your phthalo and come up with a very similar color. Um, cobalt is the next color that I want to show you. And cobalt is probably the most middle of the road blue that I have. It, it doesn't really read as a reddish blue. It doesn't really read as a, a blue that leans toward the green. It is very much right, right there in the middle, kind of a royal blue. And this is um, a brand called Holbein Watercolor Company. And Holbein is basically a Japanese company, I think. And this, this color has some granulation to it. It is um, not, a, not a staining color as a rule, unlike the Thalos. It is a mineral-based color, and so um, you will see some granulation. It is, when applied thickly, it can get a little more opaque. Um, some brands seem to be a little more opaque than others, but um, the, I think it has to do with the granulation um, that is in the pigment. So um, this is the the cobalt. I would say that it's probably a semi-transparent blue, um, but it's lovely. And I find lots of reasons to use it in skies and um, just in mixes for violets um, or, or in lots of other instances too. Next up is ultramarine. This is a French ultramarine, and people will often ask me, what does that mean? What's the difference between regular ultramarine and French ultramarine? And French ultramarine, as a rule, I believe, tends to um, lean more in the direction of red. I'm going to move my face here so I'm not in the way of my painting. Um, so this is French ultramarine by Windsor Newton. It is a beautiful, gorgeous color. Wonderful for water, and um, it does granulate, though, and so it's something to keep in mind. As you get it quite wet, you will see a lot of granulation in it, and so um, it is, it's just a, it's one of those colors, though, that if you need a violet, um, you want to reach for the ultramarine, I think, because it's going to generally lend itself to beautiful violets. It's also going to help you create more grayed greens, more shadow greens. Because of the red undertones in ultramarine and because of its dark um, value, it can go very dark on the value scale, whereas cobalt tends to max out at about a value five or six, straight out of the tube. You're not you're gonna have a harder time making cobalt seem like a dark blue. 
Um, but French ultramarine or any of the ultramarines will take you to more values of, you know, like eight, um, nine, but more like eight. Um, Antwerp also can go quite quite dark, and you can kind of see that from here. Thalo is capable of it too, although I, I put a pretty dilute wash on here. Those are probably my three darkest so far. The rest are sort of light value to middle value blues. Um, Vertiter is an interesting blue. It leans toward the lilac or the violet. And this is, um, I believe this is a, a Holbein color. It's what I would consider a dessert color because it is somewhat opaque. But I, I tell you what, I, I became acquainted with this color and love using it when I am mixing grays. I find that this is a beautiful component to um, some pretty lovely gray colors. But it is somewhat opaque and it does lean very much to the violet. And the other quality that this paint has is it tends to dry out in, in the well and in the tube. And it might be because there might be some white in it. Um, I haven't really checked the tube. The tube that I had of it got quite messy and even when I tried to um, squeeze it out with a pair of pliers, it, the tube burst before it squirted out the, the hole at the top. So it's just one of those things. Some colors tend to dry out more than others, and this vertiter does seem to do that. Um, for that reason, what I've, taken to, what I've taken to doing or decided what I'm going to do with it is I think I'm going to put it in one of these little half pans in my in my palette so that I'm squeezing out less of it at a time and making it available but maybe not expecting it to last as long as some of these colors that I squeeze out um, into the bigger wells. So that could be a solution for you too if you're finding that you don't want to squeeze or fill the whole well. You could use one of these little half pan inserts and um, I find that this is a nice way to test a color, maybe expand my palette a little bit. Um, and they're very cheap. You can find these on Amazon for, you know, you can get like 50 for 10 bucks. Um, so it's, it might be something for you to think about. Um, the next color I wanted to um, test for you is indigo. And this is a Windsor Newton color. This is a very dark rich navy blue. I love this color. Um, I just think it's beautiful. And Winsor Newton's indigo is very blue. Now, not every manufacturer's indigo is this blue. Um, many of them have black in them, and as a result, they're duller and not quite... Um, this pretty. And so that's why I choose um, Winsor Newton's Indigo. One thing that I have found though with this color is that once you put it down and you paint in proximity to it again, even when it's dry, it will reanimate. And this can be a problem if you're working in layers or if you don't hit that value exactly right the first time around and you want to glaze or any any number of reasons that you might um, want to paint nearby a wash of indigo or paint over a wash of indigo it's just something to um, to beware of and be aware of it is um, sometimes problematic and so just just know that about um, about this indigo. I, in my last lesson, I used a color called Payne's Gray. 
um, which was just kind of a quick add-on. And I feel like it's very similar to Indigo, especially the Windsor Newton's Payne's Gray. It is darker, but it also leans toward blue. And um, I find that these kind of colors, either Indigo or Payne's Gray here, both of them um, lend themselves to dark green mixtures, um, to dark blue interpretation. And what I like about this Payne's Gray, this Windsor Newton version of Payne's Gray, is that it, um, it is a very dark color. And sometimes we need to go dark, right? Or we need to gray a color down. And so this can be a this can be a lovely way of doing it. And in fact, I'm thinking about, I'm just talking out loud now, sharing my inner dialogue with you. I'm thinking about substituting this Payne's Gray by Winsor Newton for my indigo permanently on my palette. So it's just, I'm, uh, I'm in test test mode. My palette's always evolving because I love color and um, I like experimenting with new colors too. Speaking of which, these three colors, these next three colors that I'm going to show you are colors that are kind of new to me and I'm having fun with them. This first one is a color called Sodalite. I think that's this one. I think they're both the same. Yeah. And this is a Primatech color by Daniel Smith. And what I have loved about this color is that it, um, it sparkles. <laughs> and I love that. I just do. I can't help it. I think it's really pretty. And it sort of gives life to this dark blue once it's dry. You can't see it when you're applying it, but oh boy, is it beautiful and sparkly when it dries. So both this Payne's Gray and the Sodalite are um, vying for a place on my palette to replace this indigo. Um, we'll see. We'll see what I end up deciding. But, you know, tests like this help help me in my decision making process for you know what is my favorite and you should be thinking about this you know color is color and there is no magic color that makes green or no magic color that makes a pretty violet um, it's up to you to be discerning those things for yourself and saying what color makes me happy when I put it on the paper does it make me smile and if it does um, use more of it and squeeze it into your palette and let it have a, a permanent place and um, and you know hopefully it will bring you more joy as you paint and we all need reason more reasons to smile when we paint right um, this other color that I'm going to show you now is one called Kyanite, and this is another Primatech color. It's another um, blue. It's a little bit more of a gray blue, though. Um, it doesn't it it doesn't quite have that same um, quality as the um, the Sodalite of being um, very similar in color to the indigo and the um, Payne's gray. I also see right away that this color is got more opacity to it and it's also very sparkly. So um, the sparkle is is a good thing in my in my book but it could be that its opacity would make it kind of a muddy um, muddy mixing color. Now, you know, if you're mixing a gray or you're mixing um, a, a, a color that you're not so worried about its purity, that's probably not such a bad thing. Or if you just want to play around with um, 
letting the color be um, just kind of sparkly and fun on your paper. I'm trying to smooth this wash out a little bit. Um, this kyanite might be fine for you. I haven't really used it a lot. I just thought I would um, bring it out for this test. I do know that another very dark blue that's out there that a lot of artists use to good effect is this Prussian. And look at this, it's so old, I can't even squeeze it out in my palette. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to puncture it. And we'll see how that goes. Let's see, what can I puncture the end with? Maybe with this atomizer. Let's see if I can find some, some paint that's still moist. I think it might be dried up in the tube. Huh, yeah, I think it is. Okay, well, so much for this test. We'll see if I can squeeze out some something there. Prussian is known, oh, you know what? It's, it's moist down here. I wonder if I cut into the tube. Sometimes that's what we need to do, is we need to kind of release the pigment that is, hopefully I won't cut myself on camera here release the pigment that is moist on the interior of the tube. Let's see if I can squeeze it out with my pliers. I often keep a pair of pliers nearby for squeezing out paint because my hands tend to hurt, get, I don't know, they just tend to not be very strong in some instances. So here's a little bit of wet paint toward the interior of that tube. We'll test this Prussian. Darn it, we're gonna, we're gonna do this. So here it is. It's a very brilliant dark blue. To me, it reminds me of Thalo. This is Prussian also by Windsor Newton. And I should probably tell you that this tube is probably like 15 years old. So it, it's probably one of those situations where I've held, opened it and then held on to it for a long time. Now, it's very transparent. It's, it's very brilliant. And it's, I think it's a beautiful blue. Boy, maybe I need to, um, maybe I need to think about using it more. Um, it's really pretty. Can you see that? It uh, has a very beautiful, beautiful hue to it. And one that's quite different than any of the others that are here on the, on the paper. So, that's pretty cool. I, I like it. Maybe I'll maybe I'll get some some fresh. <laughs> maybe I'll get a fresh tube of that and think about having it available. But this is basically the the lineup of blues. The majority of my colors are transparent, and that's by design. I um, I prefer to work with transparent pigments, but I can tell you that um, in the lineup here. The opaque colors were the cobalt teal, the cerulean, the manganese has set up on top a little bit, the sky blue has set up on top, and the verditer is, um, a, a, I can appreciate that it, there's a little bit of sediment on top of the black here, and also this kyanite. The sparkle is definitely, is definitely beginning to show up. And you know what? I said that this sodalite was sparkly, but honestly, I'm, I'm, not seeing, I'm not seeing the sparkle yet. Maybe it has to be even drier before I appreciate it, or maybe I'm mistaking it for the kyanite, because I can see that the kyanite definitely has a lot of sparkle in it. So, let's try some lifting. 
Um, I'm going to lift with just a regular brush, but I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay down some of that tape so that I get kind of a neat line going across the page. And I'm going to just take my tape like this and I'll secure it down. And then I'll take this as well and I'll leave a little gap. A little gap. And I'm going to just try to lift between these two pieces of tape with a brush and see how that goes. Usually when I lift, I like to lift with um, just a flat synthetic brush. So I'm going to just use this one here today and just see what I can do. For the phthalo, I'm going to just try to lift back to white. And I can lift it, but it's still leaving residual blue there. Let's see how I do with this green and blue this teal mixture of the phthalos. And again, I can lift back to white, but there's still some residual color there. Now the cobalt teal, let's see what that does. That's also leaving some residual. In fact, almost even more than the thalos. Isn't that interesting? Well, I don't know if I can say that. It's coming up. But there's still some residual color there. OK, let's try the Antwerp. Up it comes. And I think I'm going to get a paper towel in my hand so that I can do a little, I can do a little blotting. And this is coming up quite well, considering how dark it was it's almost coming back to white. So this is the difference between a staining color and a non-staining color. And you know, this is something to keep in mind too. If you sometimes it's easier to paint an entire passage and then lift back to light than to paint negatively around a lot of light shapes. So to have a color that you can lift um, gives you a little bit of freedom. Um, cerulean is next here. and Let's see what we can do with that. I'm going to just blot that up. And that's coming back to very light hue as well. So very liftable, almost back to the white of the paper, both of these. Very much different than the stainers that I have over here. Um, so manganese, let's see what we're doing here. So I'm basically getting it wet, lifting it off, getting it wet, lifting it off, getting it wet. This is staining a little bit more than the cerulean, certainly, and more like think about how dark this Antwerp was but look how light it's gotten lifted. Manganese is much lighter but I'm having trouble lifting it to any lighter value than this. So very interesting. It doesn't it's not really the depth of the color that determines whether or not you can lift it so much as the staining quality of the pigment. The sky blue is 
doing a good job of coming up. Isn't that nice? I'm almost back to white there. And maybe that has to do with the fact that there is white pigment in that paint. But that's, um, I mean, that's pretty much the white of the paper there with very little effort. How about this cobalt? Generally, I have a pretty easy time lifting cobalt. We'll see if this is still true. Yep, look at that. So easy. Non-staining, much darker than the manganese, but much more easily lifted than, um, than the manganese. So very interesting. OK, um, let's see how this next line of darker pigments performs. I'm, uh, I'm pretty interested in what this is going to do. I'm going to take this line of paint off. Wait, I think maybe I'll wait till it's dry before I take that off of there so I don't damage the paper. And this is not quite dry. Maybe I'll just quickly take a second. Bear with me, it'll take me just two seconds to dry this. Okay, so coming back here then, now I've got the French Ultramarine, and that will be our next test, but I'm going to just tape a line again so that it looks a little bit neater. And kind of limits the area in which I'll be lifting. Okay, so um, just from my past experience, I can tell you that um, Ultramarine generally lifts for me. We'll see if that holds true today. So a lot of times I'll, I'll tell you that I don't reach for my thalos um, because I know how staining they are. And uh, it doesn't mean that you can't lift them, but it's just easier to lift some of these other colors on the palette. And so you can see that the ultramarine is very easily lifted. This vertiter is a very light color, but it too lifts like a champ. Indigo, I would predict based on how easy it has been to reanimate it in the past, it's real easy to get up and off of there, but it does stain. It does stain. It it moves readily, but it's a stainer. Payne's gray. Let's see what it does. It also lifts off the paper pretty quick, and stains a little bit, but maybe maybe less than the indigo. Isn't that interesting? Even though it's blacker in nature, I almost feel as if it lifted better than the indigo. Sodalite, you know, I said that that one had sparkle in it, and I am not seeing any sparkle. So I think I misspoke there. I think I was thinking of kyanite when I said that it was a sparkly color. But it is a nice sort of similar, kind of a navy color to the Payne's Gray. Maybe it's definitely bluer than Payne's Gray. And it lifts very readily. It's very, very easily lifted. And I think it lifts better than all three of those very dark blues that we just tested. 
Kyanite does have the sparkle in it. It is a Primatek color by Daniel Smith and lifts like a champ. It's going to come up pretty much to white from what I can see. Yeah, it's an easy, easy lifter, and yet it's quite a dark color. This Prussian is very brilliant, very pure. It's not um, a granulating color at all. I can see that, but it is a stainer. It, um, it's not going to come up as easily as the other colors. It's sort of similar. Um, maybe it stains less than indigo, but it's it's pretty. Um, it's it's more of a stainer than the sodalite and the kyanite for sure. I really like that Prussian blue though. I think it's quite lovely, and it's very similar. I feel like to this Antwerp. That went. That's very interesting, because that could be. Um, that could be a good color to maybe think about um, jockeying for position on my palette, you know, um, if, I'm, if I wanted to look for a substitute for Antwerp. Um, boy, this has really been a very interesting um, exercise. I'm going to lift up the tape here and kind of show you what we're left with. Whenever I pull tape, I try to pull it on a 45 degree angle. I don't try to pull it straight against the page. I try to kind of pull it down in a way. And I find that that um, preserves, it just seems to preserve the, the paper a little bit more readily. Um, so if you're trying to remove tape from a piece of paper, just try not to avoid pulling straight or try to avoid pulling straight back and pull more down and away um, so that it comes away at an angle. And you can see the lifted lines and the, um, the lines with the Sharpie. I'll pull this one away at a different angle. And this washi tape is kind of fun. This is just very um, inexpensive, and I think I got it at Tuesday morning. And it can it can be um, a nice, gentle alternative to masking tape um, in instances like this where you might want to mask. There we go. I'm liking that. I feel like this chart is going to be quite attractive. Thanks to this, the masking of the tape. Maybe I'll leave that there for the next the next line of colors. So, this is the big reveal. My hands are full of tape. Okay, well, you know, I hope that this is helpful to you to see how I play around with things and what are some of the thoughts that I'm thinking as I consider colors and their place on my palette. Um, Carolyn, I'm happy that um, I'm happy that you found it helpful, and I hope that all of you will consider um, maybe playing around with your colors a little bit like this. If you do, how about putting your um, how about putting your charts up on the Watercolor Fun and Free page? It would be fun to learn what you learn about your palette and maybe you'll find that there are colors that you have in your in your stash that you feel like 
deserve a place on your palette and maybe you'll find that the colors that are on your palette are somewhat disappointing. Um, you know, we all sort of take the word of our instructor when we first get started and say, oh, this is, I'm going to use this color because they use this color and they like it and I don't know anything so maybe I'll like it too. And if you're like me, you've got 50 gazillion tubes of paint and you don't really know maybe as much as you should about all the colors that you own. This is a fun, fun way to, uh, to sort of test things out. And I, I like it. I feel like it was um, a very valuable little exercise. And I hope that you found it helpful too. I will be back next Friday with um, another little freebie for you. And I wanted to just say that Janet Rogers uh, is coming this fall. And her workshop is now 50% full. And we've been selling the, the seats for about, um, I guess it's about two and a half weeks now, and 50% full. So if you are considering coming, and I hope you do, I would love to have you come and study for us for a fabulous week. Um, I would love to, to encourage you to um, get on the list and sign up for Janet. I'll put the link to sign up in the comments here today. Um, I'm hopeful that you'll, um, that you'll find a color on this chart that is, is going to be fun for you to work with. Um, I don't know your name. I, I don't think you've given, um, I don't think you've given permission to the eCam uh, application that, um, that I use to use your name. But um, I hear that you say it's so fun that you've been considering Prussian blue for a while. So thank you for validating the choice. I know I'm really, I'm really thinking that Prussian may make its way onto, um, onto my palette. Perhaps instead of indigo, it, it's, it's dark like indigo. It is um, easily lifted. Um, and I think it also is very similar in color to Antwerp. So wow, some, some real considerations to think about. Oh, is that you, Delane? Oh, well, hi there. Um, thanks for watching. Um, go get yourself a, a glass of wine, and maybe you've already had one while you're watching with me. I think that's going to be my reward for a busy day of packing. I'm getting ready to move in a couple of weeks, and today I went through my closet. That was, that was an eye-opener. Um, in Dan Throne Blue is um, a question that Cheryl's asking about, and I am thinking about getting some of that because I have heard of a few artists that are using it, and I will tell you that the assumptions that I'm making about it due to the chemical sound of its name is that it's a modern pigment and most modern pigments are transparent, staining, light fast, and not granulating. Um, so it'll just be, um, it'll be interesting to see if that is the case. I may, I, I think I might even have some in my stash somewhere, but I, I don't have, um, I don't have access to it right now. But when I do, I might just add it to my chart. So if you test it out, let me know. I'd be interested in any of your experimental results too. Take care, everybody. I'll see you next week on Friday. Bye. Thanks for watching. Invite your friends. I would love to have them as part of our group.